Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Walter. Hi, Martin. Are you doing well? I'm not going to answer you. Okay, so we'll skip that part. What do you have in store for us today? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about the wars, Roe versus Wade, Hegelian dialectic, fireballs, all these things that uh, some of our theologians call conspiracies. <laughs> <laughs> so let's ask the Lord for a blessing on this discussion. Our Heavenly Father, once again we are here to ask your blessing and to guide us through this discussion and to enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Martin, if you attempt to place current events into the prophetic picture, then you're bound to have some enemies, right? Yeah. You But uh, that comes with the territory. And I don't think we should allow that to deter us from our objective. So let's jump right into the prophetic picture and the times we are living in and see if we can find any interesting correlations. Now we've had some spiritual lectures of late or talks of late. So now let's contemplate the current events and fit them into the picture. And I think we'll have more than one on this portion because there's so much happening. It's hard to keep up, right? Uh, to get all together, you start putting a PowerPoint slide together, and before you know it, it's grown so much that you have to start... All over again and cut. get this piece in and that piece in and cut that piece out. Anyway, it's amazing how things are developing in the world. Let's start off again with this letter and manuscript story about Nashville. And I know we've spoken about this before, but uh, this is a prophecy. And sooner or later, if we believe that it is a prophecy, then it should come to fruition, right? And uh, we read here, when I was in Nashville, I had been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed, houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, they said, and you knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they had never told them or given them any warning at all. Why start with something like this, Martin? Because I, it's, this may be pertaining to Nashville, but there's the same warning the whole world. And all the cities. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a warning, get out of the cities, get out of the cities. There are things happening. Why would they uh, finger Nashville here? Well, Nashville, as you know, is the music center, right? Mm -hmm. We've spoken about that before as well. And all kinds of music come out of there. It's supposed to be uh, quite a conservative area. But, you know, as we often find in these very conservative areas, that there is a very liberal push as well in the same district. Hmm. So let's have a look why. Tennessean said, Nashville's Athena statue was unveiled more than 30 years ago and we haven't stopped ooing and eyeing. For decades, the full-scale replica of the ancient Parthenon stood in Nashville, but without its Athena. That changed May 20, 1990, when the 42-foot-tall Athena Parthenos statue was unveiled to a crowd of thousands. The unveiling was a huge affair, with more than 5,700 people filling into the Parthenon, to walk by and view the statue. And then for 12 years, Athena was a plain white statue. Then in 2002, Athena was gilded in gold to more closely resemble the original. According to Metro Parks, the project also included 
painted details on her face, wardrobe, and shield. So basically, this is a replica of the Parthenon, full scale, by the way. That's it. It's quite a magnificent building, and they have this, in my opinion, quite ugly <laughs> Athena standing in it, for 42 feet tall. That's quite impressive. Yes. So, obviously, you can see this as a tribute to the once spectacular site that was in Athens, mm -hmm. or maybe it's just a rebuild of... Um, of pagan worship. Of pagan, pagan worship. Well, either way, it sends a message to the world mm. that they align themselves. Now, not everybody in Nashville, of course, aligns mm. themselves with this, but it does send out a particular message. And at the time, there was quite a furor in 1990 during the unveiling ceremonies of Athena's statue in Centennial Park on May 20, 1990, the Reverend... Mal Perry stands at the entrance of the park to protest Athena's role as a pagan image. And he had a placard which says, Idolatry comes to Nashville in guise of art. And he quotes Exodus and Acts and 1 John. So, Martin, would you say that there is this conflict between the pagan element and the Christian element? Definitely. And if you take this that he said, the guise of art, yes, wasn't art also very prevalent in the ancient times? Yes, of course. And uh, if you make that plural, the arts, mm -hmm. uh, then it includes, includes Jesuit theater. And music. And music and all of these things. So this is basically symbolic of, of a certain message. Mm. And this is not really a subliminal message. It's a pretty blatant message. So Nashville is, a, is an interesting crucible where ideologies collide. Now, what if disaster struck mm. Nashville? Which side would that strengthen? The conservative uh -huh. side. All right. So it's just an interesting thought. It would send this pendulum... Mm to the right, and people would say, yes, we told you so, yes. we told you so. Because, because of this art, the pendulum was swung to the left. All right, so let's just use the story as a, as a stage setter mm. for our discussion. At the moment, the pendulum is hanging towards liberalism. But there are a lot of noises that seem to indicate that that pendulum might be swinging back towards conservatism, right? Yeah, because not long ago, with just the previous administration, it was quite to the right. And, and then it swung supersonically to the left. And now there is such a hoo-ha, it might just swing back to the right, right? Now, how do you let that pendulum swing? What do you do to make it swing? Well, you play a game, and it's called the Hegelian dialectic, where you allow these opposites to clash until you get what you want. Mm -hmm. hmm? That's it. And in the, in, in the process, you have the pendulum swinging from one side to the other, and eventually it will swing so far to one side that it might swing even further to the other side. Mm -hmm. And then you might find a fulfillment of prophecy in the process. Is that possible? That's exactly how it is supposed to eventually work out according to the Bible. Yeah, it's interesting in this uh, vision that Ellen White had, she spoke about the pillars that came down. Now, this building, the Parthenon, is, of course, a building that consists of pillars. Yeah. But there were other buildings constructed afterwards around it, making almost like a complex, also with pillars. Mm. So it's just interesting, and uh, we're not being predictive about times or anything. It's about the ideology. That's it. About two ideologies that are clashing. And that ideology is not only seen in Nashville. 
And yeah. that's why it, we'll get to those parts later. Yes. Well, this is what it looked like when it was still white here on the left. And now what it looks like in its gilded form. And uh, I don't know. Would you bow down to it, Martin? Definitely not. I don't think there's anything worth bowing down to, do you? But it's just the symbolic message. And here's an article in Wikipedia, and you can see that it is a full-scale replica of the Parthenon. Nashville's nickname is the Athens of the South, influenced the choice of the building as the centerpiece of the 1897 Centennial Exposition. So this comes a long way. So this comes after the religious awakening. Yeah. So there's a pendulum there. Exactly. You had a religious awakening. The pendulum was on the right. And then you have this interposition and the pendulum swings the other way. And it's right in the center of this biblical belt. Yes. A number of buildings at the exposition were based on the ancient originals. However, the Parthenon was the only one that was an exact reproduction. It was also the only one that was preserved by the city. Although the Knights of Pythias Pavilion building was purchased and moved to nearby Franklin, Tennessee. So we're talking about ideologies and we're talking about possible prophetic fulfillment. There's something else that's interesting in Nashville. And uh, this comes from Crooks taking the Catholic pulse, June 19, 2022. And there you have the Dominican sister helps with work on new translation of the book of Revelation. <laughs> now, Martin, will that be a Protestant view? No, definitely not. <laughs> no, definitely not. And who is being portrayed as the bad guy in the book of Revelation, the, the correct original one? Well, of course, it's the beast. So it might be interesting. And his associates. So this is also something that is happening in Nashville. So for the past five years, Sister Mary Dominique Pitts of the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia Congregation in Nashville has been deep in study of the book of Revelation. You know, Martin, perhaps we should send her a couple of DVDs, all right? The man behind the mask, mm -hmm. and send her a couple of uh, the WhatsApps that we've been doing and see what the result of that would be. Yeah, that's Definitely a good idea. Okay. Quoting the project's website, she said the purpose of the translation is to create the most extensible and helpful set of notes for the entire Bible with information of interest both to biblical scholars and casual readers. The best approach contributes to the richness of Scripture in, for example, biblical polyphony, resulting from the different versions and will restore the Catholic feel and appreciation of God's many voices in Scripture, she added. So we want this poly sound. Nashville is the place of sound. So let's send poly sound into the world rather than mono sound. Martin, I like the mono sound of this book. Don't you? Definitely. Do you want a poly sound of it? No. If I may make a pun, couldn't it then be phony? <laughs> <laughs> Might just then start to sound like a clanging cymbal. Correct. Martin, there's only one word of God. You can't have polyphony, biblical polyphony, different sounds, so that different versions will restore the Catholic feel. Only if there are different versions can you actually restore the Catholic feel. Because that is called Babylonian confusion. Yes. Hmm? So we, we seem to be getting Babylonian confusion out of Nashville. Mm -hmm. We seem to have paganism. We seem to have a clash with some of the conservatives, at least in the 1990s. So it's interesting to see what will happen in this particular place. 
So Martin, let's just go to monophony <laughs> and have a look at what the Bible has to say about the end times. And uh, we know these verses, but just to set the stage. Revelation 13, verse 14. And deceivest them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles. This is now the second beast of Revelation. The one that comes out of the earth and not out of the sea. In other words, not out of the multitude of nations, but the separate power that arose in an area not populated by, by nations at that time. So it refers to the United States of America. And it had power with these miracles to do in the sight of the beast. So there's association between the second power and the beast power, which is Catholicism. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. So the image of the beast will develop. And it has to be an image of the beast. An image is something that looks like the original. We just saw a statue. That's that was it. an image. And it was like the original, apparently. So what was the original? The original was a church and state union. The church made the rules and the state executed them. Yeah. That's what it was, right? So in other words, this is a prophecy that in the United States of America, the church would once again make the rules and the state would implement them. Mm -hmm. right? That's exactly what it says. Now, whether you do that openly or whether you do that clandestinely is, is irrelevant as long as it happens. Mm -hmm. So this is a prediction that church and state will come together, which is, of course, contrary to the Constitution. And this image to the beast that had the wound by the sword and did live tells us that the first beast is definitely not dead. But he has a lackey who does his work for him. Yes, that he doesn't get all the flag. Yes, so he is like Herodias, mm. whispering into the ear of Salome, the daughter, telling her, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And sooner or later she's going to do that. But not to make it too obvious, they'll make it a blanket law and lop off some heads besides those of John the Baptist, right? Very good. And in verse 15 it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That's interesting. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause and as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. So there is a death decree coming. Martin, that is a biblical prophecy. That's not a conspiracy. No. So this second power, the United States of America, will become like the first beast. It will be a church and state union. And somebody is whispering into its ear as to what it should do and how it should be done. But in order to achieve that, you have to sway public opinion. Yes. So that's where your pendulum comes that's in. That's where the Hegelian dialectic, the game, comes in. And you have to manipulate the media. Because you want the media to impress ideologies into the minds of men, even conflicting ideologies, so that in the end you can have a synthesis. Yes, and important to remember, it will be on both sides. Both sides are controlled by the same power. Yes. That is always, as you say, very important to remember. But the outcome, the synthesis, will be a death decree against anyone that doesn't go along with the system, right? Anyone that contradicts the system will have to go. And he, the second beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. 
So you either do what you are told and you do it, or you are ideologically convinced that it is correct and you do it. But it is the mark of the first beast. And she has publicly claimed that the mark of her ecclesiastical power is that she moved the solemnity of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. That shows that she is above the Bible, that her tradition is superior to that of the Bible. It is an affront to the authority of God. It is a usurpation mm. of the authority of God. It actually is exactly what Satan wanted in heaven. Yes. He wanted to take over the authority. Yeah. And he's using God's symbol of his authority, where God specifically said, remember. And then in order to implement it, they will make sure that you cannot buy or sell unless you go along with the system and accept the mark of the beast. Mm. Or the name of the beast. Now, name always stands for character. Yes. Right? Yep. So if you accept the name of the beast, that means that your mindset comes into harmony with that of the beast. You have adopted its character. Whose character are you supposed to adopt, Martin? Jesus. Yeah. Ah. So you're putting on a robe that is not woven in a heavenly loom. So you're not covered by the righteousness of Christ. You don't have the righteousness of Christ. You have another righteousness here which is based on works, mm -hmm. almost sacramental works, keeping Sunday, a command of the Roman Catholic Church. That's a sacramental issue then because it becomes a matter of salvation. You will be put to death if you don't do it, right? Mm -hmm. Or the number of his name. And his number we know is 666. That's the number of rebellion against God. So here is a prophecy, Martin, that this is going to happen on, on earth. And because it's written there, no matter how much that sister tries to <laughs> retranslate it, this is what is going to happen. No matter what any theologian has to say, this is going to happen. All right, so we will have to investigate how this game is being played. Now, As we've said before, both sides of the fence are being played by the same power. So whether we're look at, looking at it from the perspective of an east-west conflict, whether we're looking at it from the perspective of an ideological conflict, a liberal versus conservative conflict, or even a party alliance conflict, Both sides are controlled by the same power. Otherwise, the Hegelian dialectic won't work, right? Exactly. So you cannot choose sides. You cannot. We've said this all along. <laughs> From you, the beginning. You can only watch it. It's like sitting in a real-life theater situation. So at the moment, we have wars and rumors of wars. So Martin, as we have said, you can use any of these dichotomies to create the dialectic, right? Yeah. So let's look at the war issue. Can a war influence public opinion one way or the other? Oh, definitely. All right. This particular war that you have now, is it just a war regarding borders and border encroachment or are there ideological aspects associated with it? It's definitely got to do with ideological aspects. All right. Has Russia quite plainly and blatantly stated that they do not want the liberal ideologies of the West to spill over into their region? Yes, they've said that. And also Putin has said that he even, even said this is not a war. This is a military exercise. It's a military exercise to set the matter straight. Yes. All right. Now, there are various opinions out there in the world, but certain opinions appear to be suppressed, correct? Well, I've mentioned this quite a while back. I used, there used to be a few channels on YouTube that you could watch that had some Russian news on it. 
You don't find any of that anymore. All right. So if you want to make people inquisitive, one way to make them inquisitive is to start censoring certain things. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you take South Africa, for example, in the old days we had a censor board. Yeah. And the censor board removed everything that was even remotely uh, below the belt or even ideologically not uh, mainstream, right? Did it manage to suppress that or did it actually make it more prominent, the opposite side? It just w uh, made it go underground and then very prominent there. And then when it surfaced, it became the norm, right? That's it. So suppression has never really worked. No, it works for a while, but then you have the opposite effect. It may be also part of this Hegelian dialectic plan. Ah, so surely after 6,000 years of experience, Satan must know how the mindset works, right? So if you ban pornography, does, this, does it disappear? No. It Not thrives, exactly. actually. It thrives, right? Exactly. But you appear to be doing something. Interesting, right? So YouTube removes more than 9,000 channels relating to the Ukraine war. YouTube has taken down more than 70,000 videos, 9,000 channels related to the war in Ukraine for violating content guidelines, including removal of videos that refer to the invasion as a liberation mission. Now, Martin, what makes YouTube so wise? And who are the controllers of YouTube that are so wise that they know what has to be taken down and what has to remain? Well, they have to be part of those making decisions. Okay. And they're a pretty powerful organization, oh, right? Yes. So YouTube's chief product officer, Neil Moen, said, we have a major violent events policy and that applies to things like denial of major violent events. Everything from the Holocaust to Sandy Hook and of course what's happening in Ukraine is a major violent event. And so we've used that policy to take unprecedented action. Now, who's the we, Martin? We will never know. <laughs> The first and probably most paramount responsibility is making sure that people who are looking for information about this event can get accurate, high-quality, credible information on YouTube, he said. So surely there must be an all-wise individual or group of individuals that know exactly what is accurate, high-quality, credible information. Mm -hmm. Now, what, Martin... If the other side also has accurate, high-quality, credible information that may never be heard, would this make you inquisitive? Definitely. <laughs> it would make es you inquisitive, especially right? Especially when you want to hear both sides. Yes, unless, of course, you're just one of those people that go with the flow. And listen to the first and only stream of information that comes towards you. But be that as it may, fear is a very important factor in channeling the minds of men. So let's have a look at some of the developments in Russia and the rest of the world. On the sidelines of the war in Ukraine, another conflict is brewing between Moscow, Lithuania and the European Union. Last week, Lithuania decided to ban transit of sanctioned goods to Russia's Kaliningrad region to protest what Russia called provocative and openly hostile measure. According to the Russian Foreign Ministry, the ban violates a 2002 Russia-EU agreement. Russia warned that it would certainly respond to the hostile actions. A top ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin threatened Lithuania that Moscow would respond in such a way that the people of the Baltic state would feel the pain. Listen in. This premier shows that you cannot trust not only the statements of the West, but also the written messages. Such attacks, of course, will respond to such attacks. 
Соответствующие меры прорабатываются в межведомственном формате и будут приняты в ближайшее время. Их последствия окажут серьезное негативное влияние на население Литвы. Now following the threat warning from Russia, the United States has thrown its weight behind Lithuania. U.S. State Department welcomed the economic measures taken by Lithuania against Russia over its invasion. We have been very clear uh, over the course of Russia's war against Ukraine and in fact well before uh, Russia began its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that our commitment to NATO and uh, specifically our commitment to NATO's Article 5, uh, the premise that an attack on one uh, would constitute an attack on all, uh, that commitment on the part of the United States is ironclad. So Martin, the Russian spokesperson, said there would be serious consequences and that there would be countermeasures which would really hurt. Yeah. Did he refer to misinformation from the West? Mm -hmm. So there are two sides to a story, right? Well, not according to YouTube. No, and not according to what the American representative said. Now, if you take Russia and the media, for example, then Russia isn't standing alone. It is associated with BRICS. Yeah. And BRICS contains many countries, including Southern Africa, South Africa, and of course, uh, South American countries. And India. And India. And India is still importing Russian oil. So they're not all seeing it exactly as YouTube would want it, right? So you've got a big portion. If you take it according to population, Probably more than half of the world's population yes. on the other side. All right. So is this a recipe for Hegelian dialectic? So even if you leave the war out of it, which is fear, there is an ideological battle here, right? Okay. Now, how far are these threatenings going? There's an article from The Independent from the 23rd of June. 2022, Putin threatens to deploy Satan II nuclear missile, which can reach UK in three minutes by the end of the year. Uh, that would be by the end of 2022, right? It's interesting that they are predicting a time, but it's always a little bit delayed. But it does create the possibility of tension and fear. Yeah, definitely. It says, we will continue to develop and strengthen our armed forces. There's no doubt we will be even stronger, he added. Russia's Defense Committee Deputy Chairman Alexei Zuravlyov last month threatened to use its RS-28 Sarmat hypersonic nuclear missile, known by, in the West as Satan II, to strike Britain in just 200 seconds. The warning came after Finland indicated its intention to join NATO. If Finland wants to join this bloc, then our goal is absolutely legitimate to question the existence of this state. If the United States threatens our state, it's good. Here is the summat for you. And there will be nuclear ashes from you if you think that Russia should not exist. And Finland says that it is one with the USA. Well, get in line. So there are serious threats being brandied. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world might just be in turmoil and fear. Now, fear is a, is a great tool to move minds. And uh, maybe people will think, well, why is Russia acting like this? Do they have perhaps a legitimate reason here and there? That's so important because, once again, you can be caught up on a side. You might just listen to all this and he's conservative and we've shown in the previous ones the things that Putin says is more, sometimes a little bit more moral orientated. That's interesting that you have these, these moral tones coming from that side. 
And then you have the very liberal tones coming from Biden's side, That's right? It. And a lot of laughing from <laughs> Camilla <laughs> Harris's side. So, yes, we have definitely a clash here. And you can tend to then want to choose a side. Yes. Even if it is Putin's We're not side. choosing a side. No. Let's make that quite plain. We're looking at a Hegelian dialectic. So, Martin, if this is just a cold war that is going to end up in a real war, or whether it is just ideological saber-rattling, that the future will tell. We know what the ultimate outcome is going to be. Mm. There will be an image to the beast. And that image of the beast will implement ideologies which are part and parcel of the character of the beast, the Roman Catholic system. That's what's going to happen. Ask yourself the question, is Rome associated and working with both sides? Yes. Is that a fact? That's it a fact. It cannot be denied. Definitely. Is it only working with the political parties or is it also working with the media moguls? Both. Both of them. Even the corporations. Everything. Everything. Rome is at the hub. So who's the puppet master? The man in white. <laughs> Must be. Or the man in black. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps yeah, the man in Yeah, let's keep that one out because we've got so many questions on that one. You've really put my, your foot into that one. People want to know who is the great pope. Uh -huh. Well, you will have to... Didn't we talk about him in the past? No. Didn't we, we show a picture of him in the past? I think we skipped him. Eh? We the Mancini family, real bloodline, and uh, who that bloodline... Or, or what that bloodline consists of and who the kingpin is currently. Then you have the white pope and you have the black pope and together they're a collective. Uh, it's all, it's all uh, it's, is very it like, conspiratorial. Yeah. So is it like the king of manna? Yes, something like that, okay. something like that. All right, now, how, how far is this saber-rattling going? It has to be very convincing, right? So let's have a look at another one and see what is happening. Many had predicted the conflict in Ukraine will kick off another Cold War. Tonight we want to tell you it has already begun. NATO has put 300,000 troops on high alert, 3 lakh soldiers. That should tell you something. What is a Cold War? Something that is not a typical military war, but it involves proxy battles. It involves economic sanctions and often a serious military buildup. Basically, everything other than what fighting with weapons entails. Troops will exercise together with home defense forces, and they will become familiar with local terrain, facilities, and our new pre-positioned stocks. Together, this constitutes the biggest overhaul of our collective defense and deterrence since the Cold War. Europe could become the next battleground. It already is with Ukraine, but the war in Ukraine has proved to be a security nightmare for the EU. It has no option but to prepare for a wider conflict. America agrees with this assessment, so it will ramp up US forces in Europe. The UK and Germany say they will contribute too. The result is this, a massive build-up on NATO's eastern flank. We, re we reaffirm that our Article 5 commitment is sacred, and an attack on one is an attack on all, and we will defend every inch of NATO territory. Every inch of NATO territory. Together, our allies, we're going to make up sure that NATO is ready to meet the threats from all directions across every domain, land, air, and the sea. In a moment when Putin has shattered peace in Europe uh, and attacked the very, very tenets of rule-based order, the United States and our allies, we're going to step up. We're stepping up. We're pro proving that NATO is more needed now than it ever has been, and it's as important as it ever has been. A total deployment of 5,000 troops. Next is the United Kingdom. It will host two squadrons of American F-35 fighters. The third location is Spain. Two American Navy destroyers will be moved there. Remember, Spain already has four American destroyers, so now it will have a total of six. America is deploying air defense systems too. They will be sent to Italy and Germany. 
but their biggest move will be in Poland. Here, the U.S. is planning a permanent military headquarters. The 5th Army Corps of the U.S. military will be stationed in Poland. This is a combat force. The focus here is on eight countries, Estonia, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, and Bulgaria. Now, NATO has a strong presence across this region. How many troops are we talking about? At least 324,000 soldiers, 3,24,000 soldiers. These are soldiers of the host country and allied nations, meaning these are NATO forces, plus the air defense equipment. So NATO now has some serious firepower on its eastern flank. It is a means to protect their own interests, that is, with the hands of Ukrainians and the Ukrainian people. NATO members and leading NATO countries simply want to assert themselves, further assert their role in the world, confirm the leadership of their hegemony in the trust sense of the word, their imperial ambitions. What would a Russian mirror deployment mean? More missiles, more warships, even nuclear weapons. Russia may have made the NATO stronger, but Putin will not shy away from sending a message. This conflict is only intensifying. Now, Martin, in terms of prophecy, is the tension and the hype increasing in the world? It's getting to a boiling point. Okay. Are there two sides? Oh, yes. All right. Now, can you clearly define them, or are both sides somehow represented everywhere? They represent it everywhere. The sides can be clearly identified with direction, but yeah. not with ideology. Okay, so we have to move from this kind of conflict to the ideological conflict as well, because basically it's going to boil down to morality. That's it. And moral laws. And those will be dictated by the first beast, who whispered into the ear of the second beast and implemented on her behalf by the second beast. That's what prophecy tells us what will happen. Now, I find it interesting that with this escalation, doesn't it appear that we're reaching a culmination point? Yes, it's actually culminating towards a plan. There must be a plan behind it. Uh, Satan is not out of control. He is a master strategist. Yes. Remember, he has a master general, and he is planning, meticulously planning his attack. Now, who is, atta who is his attack directed towards? Well, uh, God's people. And God. Yes. He hates God, and he hates God's representatives on earth, those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. They have to be eliminated. The rule of God has to go. If you this is a means to an end. Yes, if you put it like this, um, although small, God's remnant, that is his ultimate goal, because the others are all collateral. Yes. And they, in any case, wins that if they don't choose to be part of... It doesn't matter what size they choose, they're choosing the wrong side, Right. So you have to be neutral in terms of the worldly issues, but you cannot be neutral when it comes to the godly issues or else you will be spewn out of the mouth. Exactly. So let's move from the political and the war aspect to the ideological aspect, Roe versus Wade. Every city, every town burned the precinct to the ground. So there were major upheavals after the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. That sentence that you just read, doesn't it sound a lot like the French Revolution? Absolutely. And the French Revolution is the model of what the world will be like when the culmination point is reached. And we're there. We can see it. So let's have a look at this a little construct that we've put together here.
because we're going to get a flood of people. I have declared this as our safe harbor. This is where we have the Statue of Liberty welcoming people who are oppressed, women who cannot receive fundamental right to control their body or receive an abortion. They are oppressed. They're welcome here in the state of New York. We have uh, so many problems with the Supreme Court and the legitimacy. This court has lost legitimacy. They have burned whatever legitimacy they may still have had. This is a crisis of legitimacy. And that threatens the court's long-term legitimacy. The court is about to face one of the largest threats to perceived legitimacy ever in its history. The Supreme Court has lost legitimacy with the American people. The crisis of the very legitimacy of the United States Supreme Court fills me with sorrow. Martin, this is the unbiased media. Do they spread a buzzword around and everybody repeats it? Isn't that part of indoctrination? They should get Biden to use the word legitimacy and maybe uh, Vice President Harris could could have a good laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> All right. Jokes aside now, mm. is this an emotional issue? Oh, it's, it's a... You know, they were so emotional on the 6th of January. I don't see anything different in this portion now. Actually, Martin, we're not allowed to say women anymore. It's now a birthing parent. And I, I don't know, Martin, do you qualify as a birthing parent? Unfortunately not, no. All right. Again, jokes aside... Jokes aside, uh, they serve a purpose, jokes sometimes. Jokes aside, it's a very serious issue, ideological issue. Now, do people get angry with regards to this issue? Yeah, they were at the Senate, almost breaking into the Senate. Okay. Do we have a point of clash that could become violent in terms of the two sides? I think we've seen that already, yes. All right. So there is a definite Hegelian dialectic going on here. And again, let's ask the question, which organization, worldwide organization, has consistently been on the position that the Supreme Court now actually verbalized? The Roman Catholic. It's a common factor, right? The majority of the Supreme Court justices are Roman Catholic as well. Okay. Now, is there, therefore, an ideological movement towards the sentiment of that church? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, the interesting thing is, we're not arguing the morality thereof, no. because they might actually be right in terms mm -hmm. of this point. Could it be possible that if the pendulum swings in their favor on this moral issue, that the same pendulum could swing in their favor with regards to other moral issues which might not be biblical? Definitely. Like, if I can ask it like this. Nine of the ten commandments the Christians don't have any problem of keeping. It's only one that they have a problem with. There's only one. So and they can have all these wonderful rulings, but if there's one that's not in harmony with the Bible. So they might get nine very favorable rulings on their side and then swallow a tenth one, hook, line, and sinker. But the other important financial question is if the birthing parent is able to travel and if they work for the right company and are seeking an abortion, more individuals we're seeing are going to need to rely on their employer, right, for that financial support to carry that out. Now, for example, Dick's Sporting Goods is now telling us they're promising $4,000 for any employee or family member on their insurance plan to access an abortion. And there's a long list of companies that are doing the same thing. You've got Levi's and Starbucks. Yelp, J.P. Morgan, and many others. But the point here is, Katie, is that these benefits are provided because these companies are willing to do it, not just because of their philosophy as a corporation, but because it makes financial sense for them. The real challenge is going to be for the smaller companies that can't afford to do this uh, and for the employees of those companies that are unable to get access that way. And so 
there's going to be a tale of two worlds. If you work for a Fortune 500 company in America today, uh, you very well may get this type of health care uh, as a benefit. Smaller companies may not. I believe that eliminating the right of women to make decisions about when and whether to have children would have very damaging effects um, on the economy and would set women back decades. Well, Martin, so the birthing parent, no matter who he is or she is, can now have all of these rights. And you're getting paid to have the abortion. All right, now, this, this issue of birthing parent, have you ever heard anything more ridiculous than that? Mm, well, there's no definition of a woman left, so that probably qualifies. <laughs> all right, so we're moving from the sublime to the ridiculous. But there must be a point in it. But I also find it amazing that the woman or the birthing parent has the absolute right as to what happens with the body, except when it comes to other issues where needles are involved. Mm. Then you have suddenly no rights. How does that work, Martin? Once again, you get to the YouTube part on who decides what's right and what's good for you. So somebody decides. Now, did you see all those corporations? Biggest. Now, all of those mega corporations, are they somehow involved with the Vatican? We've shown that the Fortune 500, uh, almost all of them went to visit the Pope. Okay, so we have the mega corporations. Mm -hmm. They're in on the game. We have the media. They're in on the game. We have the religious world. They're in on the game. So there is a major Hegelian dialectic. Mm -hmm. And the state is involved. And has the state the right to make demands or to implement legislation that somehow impinges on morality? Yes. The government does not have that anymore, but now the states do. All right. So now, are we moving towards an image of the beast, yes or no? Oh, definitely, yes. Okay. CBN News says... It justifies and excuses the intent to kill a baby. California State Assembly passes amended infanticide bill fight not over. This comes from May 2022, where they had this bill. Now, the California State Assembly on Thursday passed what pro-life advocates have called a radical measure that they've dubbed the infanticide bill. As CBN News reported, it was opposed by pro-life groups who say new language added to the proposed legislation would shield a mother from civil and criminal charges for any actions or omissions related to her pregnancy, including miscarriage, stillbirth or abortion or perinatal death. Although definitions of perinatal death vary, all of them include the death of newborn seven days or more after the birth. Well, Martin, then it's no longer perinatal, then it's postnatal. So AB 2223's amended language, perinatal death due to causes that occurred in utero does nothing to change the bill's protections for anyone who kills a baby born alive during the first 28 days of life, the letter reads. Martin, no wonder people get hot under the collar, because this is infanticide, as many will say, mm. and yet the courts and the legislations implies that you can have to sh actually shift it so that it doesn't become infanticide. Now, this is a moral issue. And the moral issue, again, sides with a position taken by the Vatican. So if we move from the abortion issue to another issue, prayer, public prayer, which of course was banned under the, the so-called Constitution, and we look at that issue in another court ruling, Prayer ruling, CNN's Tubin frets Supreme Court allowing more state involvement with religion. CNN legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin argued that the government was becoming more involved with religion 
after the Supreme Court decided that a public school district didn't have the right to stop a high school coach from praying alone after football games. So this man had been fired because he was doing this at football games, and the court ruled in his favor. So reacting to the breaking news on Monday, CNN's Tubin blasted the decision as the court allowing more state involvement with religion. All of that is part of a package, and that's what Donald Trump promised he would deliver to Supreme Court. And that is precisely what he did deliver to the Supreme Court, Tubin claimed. So is there a claim that church and state is moving closer? Yes. And now there's some that are glad for it. Yes. And others that are furious. All right. Now, what if you can use these emotional issues and the Roe versus Wade debacle and the violence that comes out of it to make people so disgusted with all of this that the pendulum starts moving in the direction where prophecy says it's going to go. Yes, yes, because prophecy predicts that it will, the pendulum will actually end up on the more conservative side, where church and state will be together. Yes, correct. And society must be pushed to the point where they accept this ideologically. And the few that don't then, well, they will have to receive the mark in their hand. Okay, so actually it can be the other side as well. It can be either side. Because you don't have to wait for a particular party to win for this to be implemented. Exactly, because it qualifies that both will be fulfilling the prophecy. Yes. Okay, but now how high did the hype actually go? Well... There were assassination attempts, so that says that it's pretty serious. And then there was tremendous criticism of the government because they apparently didn't do enough to protect the judges. Mm -hmm. So the grand jury and Deitz man accused of trying to assassinate Brett Kavanaugh. Nicholas John Ross, 26, faces one count of attempted to murder an associate justice of the Supreme Court, federal prosecutors said in a statement. So here is a story of a man who was willing to go so far as to murder one of the judges because of the decision that was made. And then just to bring it back to the political realm, here is Politico, and they say that Trump actually said, God made the decision overturning Roe. Interesting, right? Remember, he promised that he'd do it. Yes. So here, God made the decision. Former President Donald Trump on Friday credited divine intervention for the Supreme Court's decision overturning decades of precedent protecting Americans' rights to abortion access. God made the decision, Trump said in an interview with Fox News. This brings everything back to the states where it has always belonged, Trump also said. This is following the Constitution and giving rights back when they should have been given long ago. This decision and others from the court that have been hailed by conservatives were only made possible because I delivered everything as promised including nominating and getting three highly respected and strong constitutionalists confirmed to the United States Supreme Court, Trump said in a statement issued Friday. It was my great honor to do so, he added. Mm. Now, it's interesting that he says they are constitutionalists, whereas the others saying it's violating the Constitution. Yeah, they say the legitimacy is gone. All right, so... Actually, what they're going to do is to define what is part of the Constitution and what lies outside of the Constitution. And this is where Sunday legislation becomes very interesting. Because if Sunday legislation comes under the mantle of environment and industry yes. to give people rest, then it's not a religious issue. No, and then it is... Constitutional. constitutional. Yes. And the Supreme Court can vote that it is constitutional. But will the churches be happy? Yes, they will be very happy. 
and they will be very happy to violate the Constitution under the mantle of environment and industry. All right? So, Martin, uh, if it is also a religious issue, and you see that the violence is also directed towards a particular church or denomination, then it becomes even more interesting, right? So here's an article from June 28th, 2022. Virginia Catholic Church targeted with fire and graffiti after SCOTUS overturns Roe. So do the people involved in this kind of vandalism know who's actually behind it? Yes, because they target the Roman Catholic Church. All right. Now, for those that are against abortion, does this create a bond between Roman Catholicism and them? Yes. Is it clever? <laughs> See how that Gillian dialectic it that's works how, perfectly. That's how it works. So police in Virginia have reportedly launched arson investigation after a church was targeted with fire and graffiti in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Two of the messages read, this won't stop, and separation of church and state. Now, Martin, this is very interesting because this is what we were speaking about right in the beginning, out of the book of Revelation. It's going to come about, this image of the beast. Does this kind of violence, again, create a bond of sympathy with this ideology? Yes. It does, right? So the separation of church and state eventually will be welcomed by a large proportion of the society, everybody who is disgusted with how far mm -hmm. the pendulum has swung to the liberal side, right? So on its website, the St. John Newman Catholic Community Church has posted a link to a message from Bishop Michael Burbage of the Catholic Diocese of Arlington saying, we thank God for this welcome decision of the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. This bond of sympathy is incredibly important for the fulfillment of prophecy. That's it, because now you've had a Catholic and Trump saying exactly the same. All right, now is it only the bishop that was happy? No, here's another article which says that the Vatican praises Supreme Court's abortion decision says being pro-life means supporting other issues as well, but they don't spell them out, right? Mm -hmm. So is this a package? Yes. The Vatican has praised the Supreme Court for standing for life and reversing the country's nearly 50-year-old stance on abortion. Pope Francis previously compared the act of abortion to hiring a hitman, but has steered the Catholic Church to see pro-life as a larger issue than just abortion. President Joe Biden, a devout Catholic, called Friday as the Supreme Court announced it was overturning Roe versus Way, a sad day for America. Is this a Hegelian dialectic? So the president of the image is actually against the image, but for it as well, because he's part of it. He's a Catholic. Now, by his <laughs> negative stance, is he giving the pendulum a push to the right? Yes. He is, right? <laughs> Martin, this is very interesting. And uh, I believe this is the end game. No, definitely. All of these issues are a smokescreen for the other issues. Yeah. Right? Mm. But the real aim is the other issue. Now, let's have a look what all of this has done to the image of the left. Mm. And how is the pendulum swinging, if it is swinging at all? Well, the New York Post reported that CNN ratings tank in first weeks under new boss Chris Licht. Down go the ratings. That's it. Now, here's a very liberal uh, news media, and it's tanking, it's going down. So cable news giant CNN has seen its viewership 
fall in recent weeks under the helm of newly installed network president Chris Licht, according to the latest Nielsen ratings. Both MSNBC and CNN trail the ratings. King of Cable News, the Fox News Channel, which is owned by Fox Corporation. Now, Fox is more the conservative side, mm. right? Do we see a pendulum? The pendulum is swinging. We don't have to read the whole thing. Yeah. But uh, the, the picture is clear, right? Now, normally it was status quo that the left pretty much stuck together not only politically, but also in their ideology. But we see more and more people that are supposedly left drifting towards the conservative side, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here is a very liberal man, Jimmy Dore, and he is making some noises that seem to be indicating that he is fed up with some of the very liberal ideologies and ideas that are coming out of the left. And he even stated some of these things in an interview that he had with Tucker. So let's have a look at what he has to say. So a lot of people got upset again. Uh, I got I went on Tucker Carlson. What? Yesterday. And people don't like that I talk to his audience. So, I, Jimmy, why do you go on Tucker Carlson? Because they won't invite me on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, Emma, what, uh, any of the other ones. Uh, I will go bring the message uh, anywhere they w will have me. The Biden administration is blaming it inflation on Putin. And so here we go. Putin now, are you Jimmy. keeping a list of all the things Putin is doing? Uh, Russia is very powerful. They control a lot of things. Uh, they overthrew our government. They committed a coup on America. They control the gas prices and the Russia is responsible for our inflation. And let me just tell you, uh, last time I checked, Russia couldn't get their good vodka into Trader Joe's. So I don't think they're really controlling everything like they say they are. OK, uh, so the, the, the Democrats right now are in power. They have complete control of government. And like all politicians, they don't want to take the blame for anything. They want you to blame everybody and everything or anybody and anything for the pain that you're feeling right now, except blame them, the people with the power right now. And so that's why everything comes back to Putin, because Putin is a pro proxy for their Trump hate. Right. And you said Larry Summers blamed January 6th on inflation, which is an old uh, a Clinton advisor. So uh, what, what they don't want us to realize is that we have a unipolar government, right? So yes. if you vote for uh, Joe Biden, it, it's you're voting for uh, Goldman Sachs. If you Mitch McConnell, the same thing. You're voting for our oligarchy True. and they don't want you to know that. And as soon as people wake up that we've been being screwed by the same billionaires that control Joe Biden, that control the Republican Party, that's what scares them. They don't want us to. They don't want me on your show talking to your audience, telling them that people on the left, we smell a rat. And we know that Joe Biden is completely controlled by the oligarchy and the corporations. And right now, the American people are paying the price. What are we paying the price for? Not for Putin's inflation, not for Putin's gas hike. This is Joe Biden's invasion. This is NATO's invasion. This is right. Joe Biden's policies. These are Joe Biden's policies that are wrecking the dollar, that are propping up the ruble to the, it's stronger than it's ever been. And they're blaming a foreign country. Imagine if Trump did that. They'd be making jokes about it every night on the nightly news. Of course, they're not, I'm not, I mean, are the nightly talk shows, but of course they're not. They're all coddling. You saw Jimmy Kimmel have to coddle that old man, the guy who probably got stuck in a couch before he left that place. <laughs> this is who's, and you know, Joe Biden's not making the decisions. We all know that he's mentally right. impaired, and we all know that Kamala Harris isn't making those decisions because she also can't speak in clear sentences. So, who is really running the country? Well, whoever runs the Democratic Party, which is a handful of billionaires, those are the ones. So, if you're paying a higher price, they did a control demolition of our economy with the COVID lockdowns. And That's nobody right. wants to take responsibility for that. COVID lockdowns, which Johns Hopkins University proved saved zero lives. They didn't make any impact on the death rate whatsoever, right? So that they don't want to take responsibility for that. They want you to blame your neighbor. They won't want you to be angry at the oligarchs or Fauci or Big Pharma or the media that controls you, that makes you think that essential medicines are poison. They want you to blame your neighbor. It's everybody is a Trumper 
or they're not. It's you're with us or against us. And that is a that's the only message they have left. And then they have censorship left because they have failed, Tucker. Why do you think it is that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer are the leaders in the House and Nancy in the Senate and Nancy is the leader in the because they're not leaders. Those people have negative charisma. I wouldn't ask Chuck Schumer directions <laughs> to the freeway. Why are they the leaders? Because they're the ones who take the most money from the billionaire class that actually runs this country. They take the money from them and they, they disperse it to the other members of Congress so they vote for them as leader, not because they're leaders, but because they're the most corrupt. He had quite a tirade. <laughs> now, I, was, I find it very interesting, Martin, that he says that the politicians are ruled by the oligarchs mm -hmm. and by the billionaires. But I have another question for him. Who rules them? Him. <laughs> it was going through my mind the whole time. We've shown over and over, and we can prove it still. They go to one place. They go to one place, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So, again, let's go full circle. If you show part of a picture, then you don't see the whole picture. And you think this is reality, this is the world. So people are talking about Soros, mm -hmm. or people are talking about Bill Gates, yeah. or people are talking about Musk, or people are talking about whoever swings the scepter. None of them swing the scepter. There's someone else who swings the scepter. Even we've had that YouTube one, one Twitter, YouTube, all the censoring. Where does it actually come from? Didn't they all go to the Vatican? Definitely. All right, let's have a look at Elon Musk. Okay. Elon Musk posted this on Twitter, right, Martin? Is that yes. what happened? Yeah, he asked this question after there was a news article or a tweet uh, on CNN.com about Twitter that he's busy purchasing. And the question here is, who funds these organizations that want to control your access to information? Let's investigate. And uh, there you have Twitter. Now, we know that Elon Musk was quite liberal. And then recently, he's made very conservative noises. He's actually publicly stated that he would change party affiliation in the next election. So is there a trend? A swing. And now, interesting, if you read the, last, the, the portion on why he asked the questions on who's these organizations and who's funding them. So it says here, brands should force Twitter to uphold content policies under Musk. Which brands? Then he says, some of the nation's biggest brands, including Coca-Cola, Disney, and Kraft, are facing calls to boycott Twitter if the company soon to be obviously Musk owner does not uphold the policies. All right. Now, all of these companies, do they form part of those companies that met with the Pope recently and came to a particular agreement at that particular institute, right? Definitely. And after their meeting with him, there were all of a sudden certain policies starting to be implemented. Okay, so we're still playing this game. Let's have a little closer look. Here is a shirt or a jacket that Musk was wearing at this uh, Met Gala function. And on the back of his jacket, it says Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means a new world order. And uh, that's, of course, also part of the dollar, etc. So is he associated or involved in this kind of thing? Yes, because some people might now say, e, this is actually an in-your-face uh, joke or throwing it out there to show the, the new world order that he's not being ruled by them. But then some other things that he do, does uh, might make you think twice about All that. All right, so let's just take a step further. Elon Musk breaks Twitter silence to post photo of himself and four of his sons with Pope Francis. So uh, the mega billionaire has to visit the Pope and go silent during that period. And there he presented himself. Now, Martin, why would it be essential that these mega billionaires would have to go and visit Pope Francis? 
to get instructions. Aha! So Elon Musk said he was honored to meet Pope Francis as he shared a snap featuring four of his sons after 10 days of Twitter. After last sharing a tweet on the social media platform on June 21, the Tesla CEO, 51, returned to the site on Friday, writing in a message, feeling, perhaps, a little bored? Honored to meet at Pontifex yesterday. Musk wrote alongside the photograph which saw each of the Musk men standing beside the Pope in suits. All black, of course. Most, Musk's most recent 10-day break from Twitter is the longest one he has taken from the social media platform since October 2017, the Wall Street Journal reported. Martin, why is it that every time we discuss this issue, the Vatican is involved? Because the Bible said it would be like that. <laughs> Can't get around it. Cannot. Is it a conspiracy or is it just a fact? It's a fact. And uh, there's a conspiracy going on, but it's a fact. All right. So I've... that man just said that the billionaires control the presidents and the this and the that and the other. But we asked the question, who controls them? Does this give a little clue? I hope that people can follow the clue. All right. So having summed all of that up, let's return to the Bible. Daniel 11.36, and the king, that's the king of the north, that's the papacy, mm. shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god that we find in the book of Thessalonians as well. And he sits in the temple of God showing that he is God. And he makes laws contrary to God's laws. And then he has some moral issues which seem to be in harmony with God and he presents himself as God, taking the authority of God and getting the second beast to implement it by joining church and state, as we have seen throughout this entire presentation. And he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. So Martin is going to prosper. The only one who's prospering in all of this is the papacy. Yeah. For that that is determined shall be done, no matter what some of our theologians say. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above them all. He won't honor the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, women being churches. He will not desire Christ. He has a desire for the other one. But in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. It's the only religion that does that. The God of forces. We had the whole discussion of that on a previous one, so we won't go into that issue. Verse 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. He's not representing God. He's representing another deity. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The one that wanted to be God. Yes. He's the God of forces whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. He's playing games with countries. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. That's an ideology that is contrary supposedly to his. Mm -hmm. Actually below the, behind the scenes is yin and yang. Sits at one table. They sit at one table. But for the sake of the goyim, the public consumption, the king of the south shall push against him. In other words, the Pope will say one thing and Biden will say the opposite. That's Did exactly. we see it? Yeah. And you even have it further. 
Biden will say one thing and Putin will say another. And they sit at one table. They sit at one table. And they belong to their little secret societies. And the king of the north shall come against them with the whirlwind. He's going to overcome that liberal ideology. Are we seeing a pendulum swinging? Mm -hmm. hmm? With chariots. Is war involved? Is he using war? Yes. With horsemen. Is he moving his military around? That's it. And with many ships. Is he using the economy? Is Twitter part of the economy? Are the billionaires, the billionaires. part of the economy? Economy? And he shall enter into the countries, plural. His ideology is going to go everywhere and shall overflow and pass over. Martin, are we seeing a fulfillment of this prophecy? Definitely, but um, once again, if you don't want to see it like this, this is conspiracy. But I believe it is biblical prophecy, and I believe this is the end game. I believe with all of my heart that we are in the culmination of history. And may God give us spiritual eyesight. Shall we pray? Yes. Heavenly Father, the table has been laid, the guests are seated, and the meal is about to begin. All the role players have been put in place. The puppeteer is in total control. And everything is working according to plan. And fortunately, according to prophecy as well. Open the eyes of your people. Make us aware of the times we are living in. Unless it comes to us as an overwhelming surprise. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.